pleased to be here. I'm going to just be really briefly introduce all of the speakers and kind of clarify what Brian had indicated. So our first speaker is Thomas Donholt. He's a hardware applications manager in our low power organization. Our low power wireless organization. He'll be first. Then after that, we're going to do some uh, programming session with uh, Jeff Kohler and his team from Amman. And at that time, there is also another session, I believe, in the next room. Um, and then after that, we'll have Joe George. And Joe's our local uh, FE here in the Boston area, and he'll do some things on our um, Satara devices, which are in the Beagle Bone. So you want to hang around and see for that. We will have a number of boards available uh, for the folks that stay for Jeff's session and the folks that stay for um, Joe's session. So you'll probably walk away with one in your pocket, too. OK, thanks. <coughs> Okay, good afternoon. My name is uh, Thomas Allenholt. I, I work for Texas Instruments in Dallas, Texas, and I work for a subgroup inside TI called Low Power Wireless. We specialize in all the low power wireless technologies that are proliferating uh, through our industry. It could be Bluetooth, it could be Wi Fi, it could be sub 1 gigahertz, it could be Zigbee, many, many of these things. This talk here, I'm going to focus on the Internet of Things and why. It is so interesting to TI, this Internet of Things. So as we saw with, uh, with the advent of the PC, it was what we call the first 100 million piece kind of business. And that's a good business uh, to be in. And TI actually was in it before my time. And excellent that business again as it heavily commoditized. Then the, the next thing that happened was cell phone industry. It was a great business. It was a multi-billion piece business, and I actually worked in one of the groups that did the cell phone chips. Uh, the one chip that we did, we sold 750 million just that one design. So it was a very, very good business for us, but we ultimately also backed out of that. And the reason we backed out of that is that there was only one customer, or a handful of customers. And then if we are betting on the losing horse, we end up ultimately losing also. And so there's not a great business model to be in. That's why we like this Internet of Things. First of all, we believe it's going to be much, much bigger. It could be in tens of billions of pieces, ultimately. But it will fundamentally be different than the industries before, because there will not be a single customer or a five, ten kind of customer business. This will be heavily done by industrial uh, components, hospitals, healthcare, these kind of things. So we're talking thousands of customers deploying thousands of units each. This is what TI really wants. We want lots of customers, lots of diversity. And if we lose a single account with a single person, so be it. So that's why we're very interested in this business. The, and we see the, uh, the evolution of the Internet of Things as kind of an it's a roadmap I'll show here. It's a, it's a, it's a journey that we're on. Uh, this is where we were in 1980. We had a thing, some kind of device. Didn't talk to anybody. Then it got connected to the internet. It got connected to something. It could talk to the internet directly. But it was now a thing on the internet. Then the next thing is that you get, you get more things that are now connected to the internet. So the first thing down here was you have to uh, imagine like a Bluetooth device. It is only connected to the internet when it has a phone in proximity. Now this thing here is permanently connected to the internet. And that's the next thing. But again, the communication here and here goes from device to the cloud. And we believe there's a limit to how many you want of those things. But the next big thing is when things start talking to things and making decisions, like we were here in earlier in the sessions, that you have systems that make autonomous decisions, and there's no humans involved, or no internet involved, it's locally done, then we'll get to these very, very large numbers. So this, this is going to be everywhere from industrial to health to home to automotive. And I have an anecdote that I'd like to tell you. And it's about the industrial segment up here. Because the Internet of Things has already happened in Texas when it comes to your utilities. We, get, uh, we have variable rates. Every 15 minutes, you get a new rate. 
The same thing also in, uh, in California, right? So your energy meter is literally connected to the internet 24-7, 365, because it gets variable rates, and you can get updated. Uh, you can get updates on your smartphone about how much utility you've used. We had a, a very nice keynote speak by the VP of Encore, which is the utility provider in Texas. And he said that he ultimately didn't like these smart meters very much, because he was like, what do I get? Where's my, where's my benefit on this? I'm just providing an extra service to my customers and not being able to charge on it. So he wasn't very happy about it until he discovered one thing that he didn't actually envision to begin with. And he said, we have deployed 10 million smart meters in Texas. And these smart meters were, were continuously monitoring the quality of the power, voltage, spikes, you name it. And they were reporting back that there was something wrong in some small number of these meters. But there was no other complaints from the customers. The customers didn't have any complaints. So they had data, and they found 400 suspect cases where they, where they ran out and ran a truck out to the site. There's no calls, no nothing. They just ran out of the truck and said, why is the meter complaining? And what they found in all 400 cases was that with very, very small preventative maintenance, they have actually saved somebody from having a house fire. Because the meter was not, had not failed yet. But there was some wire, something in there was rusty, bad, deteriorating, and they could replace it with less than 20 bucks and did not have a house fire. And he said, he said for all the hype and the hip rolls, of, of smart grid and all this good stuff, he goes, that was the one thing that really helped them. So I think some of the things that this Internet of Things uh, can do for us, we might not yet know. So TI, of course, has a, a gigantic portfolio of devices. We have devices that will go into both the sensor end of it, we have devices that go into the gateways, and we have also devices that go into big data. What was that number from earlier? Big data. So the sensors, this is kind of where low power wireless or micro, we will be in here. We will be doing the MCUs and the wireless connectivity that would sit on these devices. And then we would partner up with some of our sister organizations uh, to do uh, the gateways and this other stuff here. Uh, so the challenge for IoT is that there's not one connectivity that fits all. You're going to have, we believe at least there's going to be many, many different types of connectivities that will be used. Anything from Zigbee to sub one gigahertz to Wi-Fi to uh, wireline communication or just good old Ethernet cables. And the good thing is that we do all of them, so we can kind of at least tell our customers that there is not one of them that is superior to the other because we happen to make all of them. Um, so the, the groups that I work for, we will, we will deploy the top four ones. The bottom four ones are also done by other groups. Um, so we see a lot of interest in Zigbee and sub-1 gigahertz for doing exactly this. And of course, Bluetooth Low Energy has, has taken off um, kind of insanely. Uh, we've deployed uh, almost 100,000 development kits. And there are more development kits in these boxes. But if we have 100,000 people playing with our development kits, there's a lot of interest in, in that type of technology. So basically, there is no one single technology that we believe will fit all. I, we do believe that IP ultimately probably will prevail. So there will be these devices here are all capable of carrying IP over them. We believe that is ultimately going to be technology that prevails. It has so far won, and it will most likely also win the next. <coughs> but power. I know that in Texas, the requirement is that you should have a fire alarm in all of your rooms. And I have that. But I hate the beeping in the middle of the night. 
I hate it. So power. So we imagine now that I now have 50 more of these devices in my house that are monitoring something from window breaks to water to moisture to carbon monoxide. 50 batteries changing per year? That is that does not seem like a, a good way to go. So we believe that energy harvesting goes alongside with also low power. So we can do these also low power devices, but ultimately batteries will still run out and we will need to change the batteries. So we need to get rid of the batteries and go to some kind of energy harvesting solution. And we have, of course, solutions that can do uh, light harvesting, it's very easy. Vibration and thermal harvesting is a little bit more complicated. Uh, and then, of course, RF. I think ultimately there will be laws against doing RF harvesting, but for right now, it's the Wild West. And uh, it's very, very simple. You can take a diode and you can harvest RF energy. Uh, but this type of technology will enable us to have the true Internet of Things because I don't have to replace batteries all the time. So I believe this is very, very important. Then the next step is security. We've had multiple discussions on security. We have a lot of security in our devices. They come built in with different types of, of security accelerators and various types of key exchanges. And, it, um, and again, I'm not a security expert, but I know that this is a very, very important field in uh, any kind of Internet of Things. So as a summary, if you look at the Internet of Things, you have to, uh, oh, actually, this, sorry, this is the last slide here on this one. So complexity. Today, <coughs> making an Internet of Things device is fairly complex because you need, uh, you need the RF device, you need the software, you need the IP stacks. So this limits the number of customers, the number of people who want to try to make this. So we really need to make it simple. So that is the that is the challenge for silicon providers like ourselves is to make it much, much more simple. Such that people that work in agricultural devices, people that work for you name it, these type types of devices that are not RF savvy or not silicon savvy, they can just take something fairly easily and successfully deploy it. This is our challenge. It is to make this type of technology simple. So this is kind of a summary of where we think uh, Internet of Things, uh, the Internet of Things success will come from. It is if we can, if we can successfully do all these five things, there will be a, a lot of deployment on IoT technology in the future. So in the next section here, I'm going to dig in a little bit and then give you an example of one of the types of, of IP technology that we're working on. And as I said, there's not one shoe that fits all. So what I'll show here is an uh, Cisco PAN technology or IPv6 technology that is running over a low power wireless Zigbee compatible uh, node or 802.15.4 node. So we have uh, various options for doing 6 pan We can do it either with uh, third parties. We have a third party called SenseNode, and they will provide a complete closed source solution that works great. But in this presentation here, I thought, this is MIT. We should do open source. So I'm going to show the open source version that we're also working on. So this is the stack kind of at the different levels of the stack that we are working on. And if you, if you look at it all the way to the bottom, you have to have some kind of radio layer. Then you have to have some kind of low power duty cycling. Then you have to have a Mac. And, and then all the way up as you work up. So the next couple of slides, I'm just going to work, work my way through the different layers of the stack that we have. And then at the very end, I'll show a quick little demo. I actually brought my own little, uh, router with me so I can demo it live. For these. So. The first thing we do is we have to have a radio. I work for low-power wireless, so we have lots and lots of radios. And the good thing with IPv6 is that it can work over any kind of radio medium. It, there's no requirement that it needs to be 802.15.4. It can be anything it needs to be. So this is both is also a curse, because it means that interoperability at this layer here is 
not imminent. I would say we're probably more than a decade away from having interoperability at the radio layer. Uh, so I think what we'll have in the in the near future and also in, in going forward for some time is that we'll have interoperability up here at the transport layer, of course, because that's the IP layer, and that, that's going to work fine. But as you go all the way down, there, there's going to be some limitations in, in interoperability. So the next layer is duty cycling. And duty cycling is very, very important. And it's very important because if we're creating a mesh network of nodes that are sitting out in the field and they're, they're communicating to each other, they need to be low power. And the only way for them to be low power is to make sure that the RF is shut down as much as possible. And this can only be done by doing some kind of scheduling, some kind of duty cycle. And this is then where all the research is going on right now. So it's, there is a standardization called 802.15.4e that is, that is uh, defining how duty cycling can be done. And they have uh, standardized on three different ways of doing it. And we are implementing all three. But this is not the end of duty cycling. There's a lot of research going on on duty cycling. But the, the long and the short is that for a mesh network to run, the radios need to be shut down at least in the upper 90% of the time, or else you would uh, exhaust your battery or your, uh, your harvesting technology very quickly. So this is a very, very important and very uh, difficult uh, research summit. The next thing is the MAC. And of course, the MAC is fairly simple. It just uh, does the back offs and this kind of stuff. I'm not going to dwell more on that one. The next thing is the uh, annotation layer. And you're here, and uh, you are actually the inventor of the 6 go pan layer. But, so this annotation layer here is, is what 6 go pan is. This, this is, when people say 6 go pan, it is the annotation layer that they're talking about. And let's, let's just dwell into that for a second. So it is the concept of being able to run IPv6 packets over uh, Zigbee type uh, devices. There's a problem in this, and that is that the IPv6 packets, the headers are kind of huge. You got a 40 byte uh, header, and you got 8 byte UDP and 20 byte TCP uh, headers. So this adds up to 68 bytes of headers just for, for the IPv6 header, right? And many of my frames in these uh, Zigbee devices are just under or just over 100 bytes in frame sizes. So that's a problem. So, and then also the IP packet itself can be very, very large. Say 1,280 bytes is the minimum that we need to support. And then these uh, 8 or 4 15 more frames here, you can see they're 127 bytes maximum. So something needs, to, something needs to be done here. And that's what's done in the annotation layer. So the first thing that happens is that we do what's called header, com header compression. It is to not transmit what we already know. Right? It's already, you're, on, you're on some kind of subnet, so you already know. Don't transmit it. So we're not losing data by doing this header uh, compression, but we're just not transmitting what we already know. And uh, and then also reusing uh, like MAC addresses and this kind of stuff that is already known. So this is what's used to reduce the amount of payload on these small little radios. Then the next thing we have to do is that because the TCP IP packets are huge, we have to do some kind of fragmentation. So these devices, these uh, networks here, they will break up a standard TCP IP packet and send it. Uh, packet or sub-packet by sub-packet onto the receiving node. The receiving node will then reassemble the whole packet and look at it. Then the next thing is routing. That is the try to figure out how the message will get made to be. And it's called, there's a technology there called Ripple. And it's, it's a standardized, um, it's part of the IETF. And it discusses how to do um, routing of TCP IP packets over lossy networks. And this is where the risk of errors is high. And this ripple is, is designed to, uh, to survive high error rates and, and still function well. It is uh, optimized for a many-to-one type of technology. 
it's, it is sensor kind of centric, where all the sensors would send data up to the mothership. The mothership can either be the gateway or some kind of cloud service. But it also does support uh, point uh, or node-to-node -node communication inside the subnet. So it works with, uh, with kind of looking at the cost. Everything that works in Ripple is looking at cost matrices. So if you have a number of, of nodes in a system, you can have many different paths. But each path has a certain cost associated with it. And the cost is the number of retransmissions that are average required to get a packet from A to B. So in here, where the nodes are close, you can see it's one. There are no retries. But out here, where they're further apart, it can take a couple of times to, to redo this packet. So then it is Ripple, Ripple looks at what the cost of doing business is to get the message from here to here. And in this little case here, you can either take this path or this path. This path here has more hops, but the cost is lower. This one here has only two hops, but the cost is higher. So it's going to, of course, take the path that has the least cost, even though it has more hops. And then uh, on top of this whole thing, we have standard UDP and TCP IP uh, transport layers. So now that we talked about all this stuff, and, and uh, we, we looked at this some years ago and said, this would be great. We'll just take a standard Ubuntu and put it onto one of our microcontrollers. Uh, wait a minute. That's not going to work. Because a, a standard TCP IP stack in Ubuntu is 20, 30 megabytes runtime. And our microcontrollers, they have uh, 8 kilobytes of RAM, sometimes 16 kilobytes of RAM. So it needs to be an entirely different stack that needs to be written. So, we went around and looked uh, at different TCP IP stacks. And there are, uh, there are some out there. And this one here is the open source one that we chose. And it's, it's written by Adam Dunkels. And it's called Micro IP. It is, we believe this, or at least I believe it's the smallest stack that there is in the industry. And it is, uh, it is very small, but it sacrifices <coughs> speed. But in general, we can sacrifice speed, because we, all we want is connectivity. So that's what he's done. He's made a stack that sacrifices speed for size. And then on top of this, we can have various applications running. This could be uh, HTTP. It could be REST. It could be, um, it could be web sockets. Uh, and this, as the gentleman earlier was saying, this is really where the interoperability then becomes very important. Is what what kind of application do we run on top of TCP, TCP to, to do this? We currently are evaluating all of these. Um, so the one that is currently filling out the most of our work is this one here called WebSockets, because it allows uh, connectivity to go through firewalls and proxies, because it is a, an HTML kind of technology. So it's basically a, it's a socket on top of a web server. And uh, this is very useful to us because it, it enables us to be able to uh, go through standard home uh, firewalls without any big issues. But the CO app is also on there. It's also very, very interesting because it is, it's, uh, it's been around for a little bit longer. It is essentially, at least I, I see it as a some kind of HTTP over UDP, and it's calling it a CO app instead. Um, and then, uh, as, of, as of late, we also started uh, working a lot with IBM on MQTT, which uh, ultimately could turn out to be a, uh, a very powerful solution to enable the Internet of Things. Um, it, has, it has these nice features of, of quality of service and, and what happens if the battery is out. And, and uh, you can uh, do these subscription-based services. And IBM is behind this with a lot of, uh, of effort and time and money. And so we think this MQTT also could do it. So here is a, uh, this is the, the open source stack that we have. It currently compiles on various types of microcontrollers. Um, we have compiled it here on a 16-bit or a 32-bit. 
And you can, of course, guess what the 16 what the 16 bit is, and you can also guess what a 32 bit is. <coughs> but it's, it doesn't really matter. It's about 50 kilobytes worth of flash and about 8 kilobytes worth of RAM to run the stack. What it means is that you can now connect a small device to, directly to the internet, and I will do that right now. I have here a small microcontroller that has a, a Zigbee radio in it, and I will add a coin shell. And it will start off by blinking for a little bit. While it is trying to get access to the uh, access point, which is right over here, here's a standard home router that I have connected to the internet. And now this thing has stopped blinking, which means that it has successfully logged onto uh, the, the cloud servers and is currently registered at the, at the cloud servers. And I'll show that in a second where it's registered. <coughs> so now this little device, as you can see, it's a coin cell operated device, is connected to the internet, and it'll be connected to, until the battery runs up. Um, this, to, to um, any of these types of IoT technologies that are, that we have today, the gateway is really, uh, can be quite complex. It can either be a complicated Linux-based gateway, or it can be uh, something that runs on a microcontroller. But the gateway itself, there's a, there's a lot of work that needs to go into this gateway and actually making it happen. So. This is uh, this is one way to develop with uh, with SixnoPan. It is to download a, uh, a VMware and then an instant Kentucky uh, Ubuntu session like this, but uh, and then start hacking away at it. And this is great because it's all open source, but it's also honestly a little bit difficult. And this will require people to uh, get up in the morning and and get their drivers to work and be able to compile this stuff. And, but it's possible. And then you'll get these nice environments here. There's actually a simulation tool that's built into this thing where you can simulate your, your nodes talking to each other. This is, this is also very, very cool and very powerful. But, and I was, I'm going to show this right now, is what if, what if we took this entire environment and brought it online? Wouldn't that be much cooler and also maybe uh, could enable a lot more people to start hacking away at this? So at the at the risk of failing, so let's see what happens. So I have a uh, so I have this uh, web page here, and you can see sensor tag number nineteen has registered as being online. This is an online demo uh, of this, and this tool here is this little guy is connected. But the next step is that. I actually want to develop code right on this device right now. So he's here. I am going to open up my little app, which is very simple. It is going to compile this little application here, and it's going to blink this LED 32 times a second. So I am going to hit run. It failed to compile. Why? <laughs> oh, look at this. There. One more time. OK, so we compiled on some server in Phoenix. I'm assuming they're using it. And it has sent the application to this board, and it has installed it right now, as we said here. And let me just show that it, I wasn't lying. So I will change this 32 to 16 and do it again. OK, we will compile one more time, and now it's going slow. So. We have now successfully done a, an IoT-based development on this little board without being connected to anything other than my little routers. There is no need for installing drivers or anything cool. People can get these little kits like this and start playing with them at home. So I think this is trying to make stuff simple and easy to use. That's what the whole idea here is. So the first development kits that we have are, are based on the standard development kits that we have today. And you can get the, they would be nice looking little kits, but they're fairly expensive. Uh, so this is a sub one gigahertz kit. You can develop long range systems, kilometers and range. You can do agricultural sensing, this kind of stuff. And then here's a 2.4 gigahertz kit. 
And then this is what we're making, which is where this little board comes from. This is the new, this is the old version of the sensor tag. This is the new version of the sensor tag. And this will include uh, Internet of Things technology. The old one here was Bluetooth loyalty only. This will be uh, different types of technologies also. <coughs> Uh, so, I, I do work for TI, right? So we have to have some kind of chip on the board at the end. And so, so here's, a, here's an ARM microcontroller that we have in the market. It has everything you would expect from a microcontroller in it, and it has the radio here down in the corner. So that is what is on this little board right here. That's this little chip right there in the middle. And this is what's inside the chip. And that little chip by itself is capable of going on the inset, and you can do what I just did. This happens to be a different one. This is a lower power version that is uh, that has not been publicly disclosed yet. But this one actually runs at one quarter of the current that is disclosed here. So therefore, this here little device runs comfortably on a coin cell. It can run for a very, very long time. So with that, that's actually the end of my presentation, and I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions, come see me afterwards. Oh. Yes, sir. Ah. So, in this case here, this is a, a uh, custom gateway that we made. So it's a it's a Linux it's a uh, home router like this, and then we have this little gateway which, which just runs one of our microcontrollers attached to an Ethernet chip. So this is not a Linux gateway. This, this little gateway here is, in fact, just running uh, kind of taking all chips. And that's what's good. And then this little home router here is logged on to uh, I have a 4G hotspot with me to make it onto the inside. You yes. mentioned uh, doing this through the Amazon cloud. Well, yeah, so it's it also be done through a, a home cloud like Eclipse. So, uh, it's basically an Amazon compatible thing that you want in your own version machine. That's a good question. I believe that I believe that would be an option. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, with all the emphasis on very low power peer radio, has there been much research done on asymmetric radios? We can have high power one radio, so you don't have to. Have one, you know, it's it's actually fairly commonly used by the metering guys, like all the guys doing electric meters and gas and water meter aggregation. They have they have as high power as they're allowed to do in the in the center, the aggregator, and then all the nodes out there. But could that be used for a lot of for you? Know, you're worried about low power local routing instead. Well, it's it. I think it makes most sense we get a point-to-point -point link or a star network, but this here I was trying to show is a pure mesh network. Right? So here you, would, you could have a hundred of these and the meshes would, would go from hop to hop. And we have a pure mesh, I don't think having asymmetrical makes any sense. But you could do it, yeah. So we compile and, and we compile and download that code. Is that native machine code or is that interpreter running on the chip? This is, uh, so I, this is in C. So this, uh, if they're running a GCC compiler on the back end. The GCC compiler makes a small binary image. The small binary image is sent up to this one here, and it's dynamically linked on top of the operating system. So this is almost like Windows that takes a new executable and starts running it. That's what they're doing here. So it is C code. Yes, sir. So if I need a board with your chip, or does it be radio? Do I have to get FCC testing on it? Yes, every time. However. The way to get around that is to use a module from our friends back up there. They they will they will sell you as many modules as you want, and you can then uh, use their FCC approval. That's the way to get around that. This is the first I've heard of uh, X instruments as microcontrollers. But can we just compare and understand them better to ones that we're more familiar with, like Arduino and Raspberry Pi? So, for example, I imagine these are probably lower power consumption and they have a wireless radio and typically our you know, and I don't have that. Yes, I so I specifically actually deleted all the charts about all of our parts, just to be a kind of an agnostic kind of, uh, kind of discussion here today. But we have 16-bit uh, microcontrollers and 32-bit microcontrollers. Uh, the 16 bits are like the MSP430 type things. They will 
against your AVRs and this kind of stuff and your PIC microcontrollers. And then our 32-bit uh, based microcontrollers, they are ARM, Cortex, and Free based. So they will go up against ST ARM or any other 32-bit microcontroller. So we have we have the entire portfolio competing against everybody else in the industry. The reason I think why ABR is so successful in the hobbyist is that they got onto the Arduino very, very, very effectively, right? And then through, through the industry. We actually have a port of Arduino to our microcontrollers also called Energia. And uh, Kathy will be looking at that one also. So. Can I run things square on my own server? Yes. Uh, is it proprietary? Any proprietary software involved in this? This is all open source. You can download off the, off the server. Great. Yeah, can I ask you a little bit more about the format that you have around with? Is it running on the router or is it running on the device itself? The router there doesn't do anything but pass the TCF back. It does not do anything. So the really upgrade is done here. The packets are received onto this device here and then dynamically linked in real time on this device. So you have to write a special code on this device. Yes, we have we have we have code on here that is capable of of reflashing the chip on the fly, and that's what you saw. It actually it actually reprogrammed itself right there. Is uh, things for a PI company or is it no? Second part? It's a third party. Yeah. And the chip is uh, on the module. What's what's is that an ARM chip? Yes, this is an ARM Cortex input. And are you doing an M0 chip? So um, we looked at the M0s. We actually believe that an M0 brings no extra value. Uh, we can make ARM M3s uh, at the same power that an ARM M0 does. Actually, this chip here is a Cortex M3 based, and it beats any other M device in the industry. It's running at 70 microamps per megahertz. Nobody else has published something like that before. I can't, I don't know who's going first. The sensor tech, the new one, when's that going to be available? This year. When, when we release the chip, which will happen in Q3 of this year, I hope, the sensor tech will be available also. And then this the stuff I just showed here today will be available also. Oh, it's just the thing square isn't available. It is. You can download this today, but this exact stuff you saw right now runs on the sensor tech. It's not in this. It's right now in the couple. How will that line up against uh, like electric or uh, Sparks Wi-Fi module? So similar, similar concept, similar product you know, there. Uh, I think I mean Wi-Fi is is great, but Wi-Fi has a long way to go to run on a coin cell. Uh, so the transmit current here is five milliamps, and the receive current is five milliamps. Our our Wi-Fi radios are considered some of the best in the industry, and they're 250 million transmit current. And they will drain this old coin cell battery in a matter of seconds. We have, Wi-Fi is is a great great technology, but it's not low power and is not going to be low power for some time. And we will keep driving these guys down too. What kind of range does that? This is a standard uh, zero to five dBm output power, so it's going to get uh, 200 meters uh, line of sight. But in, in, in the house. Yeah, yeah, in the house. Yeah. Yeah. Up in the back? Yeah, from a security perspective, how do you specifically address that device in your hand and how do you keep other people? Yeah, so I couldn't show that here today, but it's, it's actually a, it's a very good question. What they've done is that when you uh, when you put get, when you get one of these devices, uh, it will find this server here, and then this particular device here is a headless device, which means it has no display, right? so it's a little bit difficult to use. So what you have to do on this particular device is that there is a UART port. You have to get this UART port onto a PC, and then you turn it on, and it will give you a a, a multi-digit uh, ID. And you would type the ID in here by using this registered device. And that's how you would, you would log your device to your session on this website. And the communication, of course, is encrypted with AES. 
and I think you heard that it could be broken, but that's that's what we have in the <laughs> Yes. Um, what's the size of the contingent stack? You said it's the smallest, but... No, I didn't say it was smallest, I said it's small. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's 60 kilobytes. Oh. <clears throat> Come on, yeah. About 50 kilobytes. The stack itself. Thank you. So this is a 128K flash device, 16K RAM. Yes. Are you doing anything with super low power, like battery list, like test one if I need So with even with this one here, you can run this off of an energy harvesting uh, chip fairly easily. Because if this is this is five milliamp peak current, and if it's running at one percent duty cycle, it's, that's fifty microamps. You can easily harvest fifty microamps. And so this one here, I, this is what we will be demoing uh, around the world here in 2014 as our energy harvesting uh, or sensor node. Uh, but uh, to, to answer your point, we are also working with RFID, of course, yes. But it's not my group, so I don't know too much about what's happening. Will that chip root with a slow power rise? Because obviously the <coughs> if we're working that right now. Okay, let's thank our uh,